we all spend a lot of time discussing and thinking about how we want to live, our hopes, our dreams, our aspirations, but we seldom talk about how we want to die or what happens when we're near death. It's a discussion that's usually forced upon us. We all know we must all die someday, and everyone that's close to us that we love will die. But before that, I want to tell you a story about my wife, Julie. So I've never, I'd never touched a dead body before. I've been to funerals. Growing up in India, I'd seen dead bodies being taken to the cemetery in processions, and dead bodies in the streets having come to violent ends, but I'd never touched one. And here I was, holding a dead body in my arms. But it wasn't a dead body, it was my Julie, it was my wife of two decades. And she was still warm. She just stopped breathing a minute ago. And I held her and I kissed her repeatedly on her still warm lips and I held her for the next two hours as she started to cool. Her mother was by her side. When I finally realized she was gone forever, I cut some locks off her hair and tore myself away from her. I'd spent the last 28 hours by her side waiting for her to pass on after she had finally won her battle with the doctors, the nurses, and the hospital authorities and the chaplains and the social workers at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital in California to stop all futile treatment and let her die. 16 days earlier, she'd had a severe midbrain stroke and been diagnosed with something called locked-in syndrome, where she was fully conscious, she could hear, see, and feel everything, but the only thing she could do was blink her eyes. So the only thing she had to look forward to for the rest of her natural life was to lie in a bed, looking at the ceiling, blinking her eyes, dealing with a constant cycle of pneumonia, bed sores, infections, chronic back pain, and depression. A few days earlier, one of the nurses in the ICU had told me that what had happened to my Julie was a fate worse than death. All I was told in that surreal moment in the ICU by the neurosurgeon, Dr. Zauner, was that if he didn't operate on her to repair her right vertebral artery that had burst open, that she would die. And thus began the saga of the next 16 days, where I learned the true meaning of the word despair, which is when someone that you love is pleading with you to save them, and you can't even give them words of comfort. Instead, you have to tell them that they're never going to get better and that they should choose to die in order to save themselves from a fate worse than death. The last 28 hours had been relatively peaceful for her, In spite of the fire in the hospital wing that she was housed in, where she had to be evacuated, the hospital authorities asked me to leave her side, and I refused because who else was going to take care of her? And I'm so glad I didn't because she ran out of morphine, and she would have woken up and been in pain. And so then I had to run around finding a nurse that would give her more morphine without the paperwork because this was in the chaos of the evacuation where she had been taken out of the the building. The day after her stroke, the neurologist, Dr. Philip DeLeo, told Julie's mother and I, that she was going to come out of her medically induced coma with locked-in syndrome. He then explained to us what it was. Julie's mother and I had no words to, to describe the horror we felt when we realized what had happened to our poor Julie. Thirteen days after the stroke, we were to have a meeting with the hospital ethics committee to decide what to do in this situation. The hospital chaplain, Dr. The Reverend Pam Washburn, and the, the social worker, Saul Robledo, walked in and told us, the entire family, that Julia decided, communicated with them, and decided that she was going to live in a nursing home with a feeding tube and a ventilator. The entire family was horrified. I'm showing you these pictures of Julie. She loved the outdoors, she loved her animals, she was a talented artist and a sculptor, she worked with her hands, she loved gardening. This is not how she wanted to live. So when we questioned the chaplain and the social worker, and asked them how they determined this. They said they'd asked Julie if 2 plus 2 was 4, and Julie had blinked yes. That was the assessment they made to determine that Julie was competent enough to decide whether she wanted to live or die. And then they told Julie that if she got these tubes inserted in her surgically, she would be much more comfortable while she got better. They didn't tell her what better meant, that it meant just laying in the bed doing nothing in pain while fully conscious. They didn't tell her once those tubes went in, they could not be removed because that would be murder once those tubes were put in. The entire family just rose up and said, this was not possible, this, this, we couldn't let them do this to her. When the, the chaplain and the social worker finally realized that we were united in our opposition to what the fate they had decided for her, they left the room. I was falling apart. The whole family told me to be strong and to pull myself together and to fight for my Julie. Julie's sister and I went into the ICU. We sat by her side. We told her what had happened to her. 
We told her that if she went into a nursing home, we couldn't watch over her 24 hours a day. Strangers would be touching her in intimate places, and we couldn't protect her from them. So Julie was a very shy person. And we told her we, we loved her, and that no matter what she decided, we would always love her, but we wanted her to know what her true condition was. Then we asked her if she wanted to continue treatment. We had worked out a system of eye blinks where she said yes or no. She said no. I asked her again with her brother-in-law present who was a federal law enforcement officer. She blinked no, she didn't want treatment. I then called the nurse. I said, please see what she says. We asked her again in front of the nurse. She said, no, she didn't want treatment. The next day, I told her what had happened. I asked her again. I said, Julie, do you want to continue treatment? She said, no. Then the pulmonologist, he walked over to Julie and, and said, Julie, do you understand if we stop all treatment, you will die? He talked to her in this tone. Julie said, yes. Julie, do you want us to stop all treatment? Julie said, yes. I was horrified. I was powerless to save her from this intimidating doctor that was treating her with such cruelty. I went home late that night. When Julie was well, she, she had a lot of pets, and she'd made me promise if anything ever happened to her that I was to take care, good care of them, and I promised I would. So I went home with four cats, two dogs, two rabbits, fed them all, cleaned up after them. I couldn't sleep. I hadn't slept in two weeks. I called the ICU and talked to the night nurse. And she told me that the neurosurgeon had been in there and talk, talked to Julie. And from what, it, from what she told me, it sounded like he had given her an accurate explanation of what had happened to her and what her options were. And that he would come back again the next day and ask her if she wanted to live or die. The next morning, the entire family was by her side. I told her over and over again. I sat by her side. I told her over, over and over again that I loved her. The whole family was with her the entire time. She was never alone. Finally, in the afternoon, Dr. Zauner came in. All of us were asked to leave. We waited for 20 excruciating minutes outside the ICU. Finally, the nurse called us all back in. Dr. Zauner told me he had talked to Julie, and she'd indicated that she did not want to continue treatment, and she wanted to die, and that he would sign the order to keep her comfortable while she passed on. I thanked him for saving Julie from a fate worse than death. He told us we could take our time saying goodbye before we switched off life support. So the whole family spent the next two hours with her, saying goodbye. She was fully conscious, and she looked more at peace than she had in the last five days. And finally, she acknowledged each and every one of us, and finally at the end, with her eye blinks, she told me she loved me, and she knew how much I loved her. Then I looked over at the nurse and told her it was time. That searing moment of pain will be with me forever. The nurse gave her a large dose of morphine and some anti-anxiety medication, and Julie became unconscious. The respiratory therapist came in, she pulled out the, the, the feeding tube from her nose, she turned off the ventilator, pulled the tube out from her lungs. There was nothing more modern medicine could do for her except keep her comfortable while she was still breathing. There are so many ethical questions here that remain unanswered. We have this concept of informed consent where a patient has to know what is wrong with them and what their options are and what the prognosis is. It's the doctor's responsibility to tell the patient what is wrong with them and what their prognosis is. Instead, they, make, they made me, who was supposed to comfort her, tell her what was wrong with her and that she would never get better. I don't understand how they could mentally torture a patient by having them asked over and over again if they wanted to live or die. The question I'd like to ask all doctors, nurses, and hospital staff is if you were laying there in Julie's bed, is this how you would want events to unfold? So this is why I'm standing before you talking about dying. In the UK, there was a well-publicized case of Tony Nicholson, which was in the papers recently, where he had locked-in syndrome. He was a 58-year-old father of two, and he, was, he had a court fight trying to die. He wanted his doctor to help him die. The, the court refused to consider the case because they said, this is a very important question, but the law on murder could not be changed until Parliament had the debate on that. So this question is very important you know, how we want to die, and the question of expressing your wishes, what happens when you're near death. And this is beginning to be addressed in many places. There's, there's a cons they, they have something called advanced directives and living wills in the United States, in Canada, in the UK, in uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe, where you can actually state 
your wishes so that your doctors and your family knows what kind of treatment you want or you don't want if you get into a situation where you cannot speak for yourself or make decisions for yourself. You can also name a healthcare surrogate who can make these decisions for you. If you have to lay there in a bed with somebody cleaning you and feeding you, and perhaps strangers abusing you because you can't speak for yourself or, or say anything, is this living? Um, do you want your loved ones to see you suffer? No, you, it's, that's a question you all have to ask yourselves. So you can change this. You know, in the pressure cooker of the ICU, if, if you've made your wishes known, it's a very precious gift you can give, to your love, give your loved ones because then they can make these decisions for you without feeling guilt. So there's this man called Jim Lowy who worked for Mother Teresa. He founded an organization called Aging with Dignity, which safeguards and affirms the human dignity of individuals that are near death and aging. And they list these five wishes. And it lets your family and doctors know who you want to make healthcare decisions for you, the kind of medical treatment you want or you don't want, how comfortable you want to be, how you want people to treat you, and what you want your loved ones to know when you're near the end of your life. I'm trying to give meaning to the untimely death of my wife. And this is her gift to you, to make you think about these issues and to go talk to your loved ones, to your, to your family, to your spouses, to your children about these issues and make your wishes known so that nobody has to suffer unnecessarily. Thank you for listening.